Well, I think, you know, when uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi came to power, uh, obviously there have been a lot of expectations since then. One, because after, you know, after a long, long time, there has been a kind of a political party which has come to power with full majority. Because before that we had a, you know, coalition governments and they have their own problems. So there were a lot of expectations that he'll be able to take quick decisions. That's what his reputation was, and particularly he was also he will also uh, be able to have uh, a relatively free market uh, kind of economics in the in his economic policies, and he would also put uh, uh, you know economic issues on the top of the foreign policy. And now some of the things uh, he has been able to achieve, but still many of the promises still remain promises. Uh, but definitely one thing is that with his kind of personality and the way he has been able to travel, he has traveled you know, uh, widely in so many countries so far. So he has been able to connect India, is able to project India in a very positive manner. Uh, but how that will uh, become reality in terms of attracting investment, in terms of making India a much bigger player than it, it is, I think those are the issues which still one has to see. I mean, this is the policy which was quite successful policy even before, which was basically a lookist policy. Means uh, as Asia was uh, becoming center of gravity, so Indian economy, Indian foreign policy also must really orient towards Asia. So that was a very successful policy. Uh, India was also able to integrate with Southeast Asian economies, uh, also very closely with the, with, the, with East Asian economies. But when Prime Minister Modi came, so there was many projects which were still, uh, there were promises and they were not able to kind of implement, particularly connectivity and other issues. So what he said, I mean, somehow he reoriented the policy that yes, this policy has been successful, but now we also have to act in a sense, many of the promises which has been made has to be now implemented and it has to be more than economics. It also, I mean, earlier it was more civilizational, cultural and economics. It also has to be strategic. So he also started putting many things together, particularly in the defense and security field in, in uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia. Indo-Pacific, this has been uh, mainly, I mean, this, as you rightly mentioned, this was there, this concept, but when it was used by Americans, uh, then it has become more of a currency in media. Uh, the idea is that, you know, when uh, Americans, of course, I mean, Asia, when the whole Asian security and economic architecture is evolving, so all major powers, including US, which was already very much present in Asia, and Russia, and others, they would and Europeans, they would like to have certain influence in the whole evolving situation. Now, with the rise of China, obviously there are uh, there are certain worries, particularly with the Americans. So now, within that concept, the, what they feel is now Indo-Pacific means it's a much larger area in which India also would have to play a very important role in this evolving situation. And the way uh, economic, uh, I mean, uh, relationship has developed, uh, you know, between India and the United States. In that sense, I think within American strategy also, India plays much larger role now within Asia than it used to be because earlier India was, as you know, very close to the Soviets and, you know, things were changing slowly. But in the last 10, 10 12 years, and particularly in the last 5, 6 years, India has also become quite closer to the US and within that, I think Indo-Pacific and the rise of China, I think all these things come together. Now in the last uh, one or two years there has been certain uh, worries more, uh, particularly with the Chinese One Belt One Road and BRI project because uh, now because this whole particular project of One Belt One Road, it has two major dimensions. It also has a, a geopolitical dimension to this, there is also developmental aspect to this. Now since China is number one trading partner of almost all countries in this region, so for them, connecting to those economies, uh, 
and then they have a lot of capacities they also have a lot of resources to those economies is also going to benefit definitely china and perhaps some of those countries but some of those corridors if you can see within uh, one belt one road and one particularly one of the flagship project is china pakistan economic corridor which passes through disputed territory of kashmir so in for which india has certain definite reservations so that is also one of the reasons that india was also one of the few countries which actually did not even participate in the summit on one belt one road uh, because what india feel that yes connectivity is important but it has to be a larger asian project or global project rather than chinese project because some of those corridors like uh you know uh, like bcim bangladesh uh, you know china uh, india myanmar project this was a four country project uh which was initiated many many years ago but that is also now one kind of one of the corridors of one belt one road so many of the projects which were there which was already existing are put together as a larger uh, kind of uh, project of one belt one road so how india i mean still there is a bit of a lack of clarity i would say in indian thinking still how to really react to one belt one road because certain development aspects of one belt one road may be useful for india particularly in southeast asia central asia and in the middle east but uh, pakistan china economic corridor has uh, certain problems uh, and i think those are the issues in which uh, india is also becoming closer uh, not the same kind of issues are also been raised by japanese they also in fact now even certain european powers have also raising similar issues about transparency about uh, you know um, uh, how countries are may become indebted as a result of that in the long run so i think all those issues are developing so it's a very complex in that sense relationship but again the major challenge for indian policy makers is how do you really manage this relationship which is very important at the same time it has certain you know problems as i mentioned you know uh, when uh, asian security and economic architecture is evolving and asian economies are growing they are becoming richer and if history tells us anything when countries become rich there are also tensions they are also rising in the same kind of space uh, so they tend to spend more on military that has been the case in many other countries in the past the same is also happening to some extent in asia now if they learn certain lessons from history then perhaps they will have to work out certain kind of cooperative mechanism through which they kind of peacefully rise together if they do not learn anything from history then of course they'll be spending more and more on uh, defense and there'll be a lot of conflict lot of border disputes lot of things and anything can anything i mean you know things can go wrong any time and then you, you rightly mentioned there also nuclear power so um, i mean there are lot at stake for major powers all the countries which you have mentioned uh, but at the same time uh, situation is evolving they are mature countries large countries i hope they'll be able to find solutions and find certain cooperative mechanism within asia